Welcome back, everyone. Well, we've been focused quite a bit on Napoleon Bonaparte this week, doing the series uh, on Napoleon in Egypt. I had a live stream going, showing my whole reaction to all of the Epic History TV, Napoleonic Wars. So it's time to dive back into the channel we love to hate when it comes to history content, WatchMojo.com. I hate to say it, but the Watch Mojo videos, when I break those down and do a reaction to them, they tend to do really, really well on the channel. So we're going to take a look at top 10 shocking facts about Napoleon. Now I'm hoping, as compared to some of their like 10 worst, 10 best, 10 you know this or that, uh, that this one will be much more kind of solid in terms of the content. So it gives us something else to talk about, about the life of Napoleon, maybe some new things to look into and research. Link is in the description to the original content if you want to go ahead and watch the video without my commentary. Let's dive in and see what they have to say. What can we do? First of all, let me just say a couple of things about this movie. Waterloo fantastic and i believe you can see it on youtube uh i've talked about this movie before one of the best war movies ever made uh just because of some of the stuff they did in this i believe they used members of the soviet army and so when you see these shots of like tens of thousands of soldiers it's actually tens of thousands of soldiers it's not cgi it's not you know anything like that it's legit and so there are shots that you see in this movie you will never see in a modern movie now uh this guy who plays marshall nay looks just like him which i love uh, there's so many things to absolutely love about that movie if you have any interest in the napoleonic wars you definitely have to check out the movie waterloo uh and i think um Plummer, uh, forget his first name. Christopher Plummer, the actor, plays. Is he the one that plays Wellington? No, he doesn't play Wellington. Had to go back and check. It is Christopher Plummer who plays Wellington. So, really, really solid. Uh, anyway, let's continue on. What can we do? What can we do? We can fight! From zero to hero, and then back to zero. Welcome to WatchMojo.com, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 10 shocking facts about Napoleon Bonaparte. For this list, we're reviewing unusual and generally unknown facts about this French emperor's life, including his rise to and fall from power. Number 10. His wife's mm. affair was a tabloid sensation. Yep. I want you to write to me. Once a day at least. Twice would be better. Josephine de Beauharnais, widowed and with two children, apparently... And she's widowed because her first husband was guillotined during that whole mess of the French Revolution. ...had quite a few gentlemen suitors in her day, but then she met Napoleon and became his wife. When Napoleon was away at war, she was left alone at home, which led her to start a relationship with a French military man. Rumors of her infidelity swirled and finally reached her husband's ears. The man I love is there. It takes two to love. What are you insinuating? Distraught, Napoleon wrote a letter to his brother, but the message was intercepted and eventually found its way to a British newspaper. So uh, in this particular movie, John Malkovich, I don't remember if this is a movie or a um, TV series or what, but John Malkovich is playing uh, Talleyrand in this one, and I, I think he does a, a pretty good job with it. Um, yeah, so if you go to um, the uh, Picpus Cemetery in in Paris, I was just there a few weeks ago, where um, the Marquis de Lafayette and his wife are buried, uh, they are right next to the mass grave. There are two mass graves that are right next to each other um, of all of the uh, guillotine victims from like the the six week period of kind of like the great terror, like the the mass executions that were happening. Um, that were they were all guillotined nearby, and there's a big monument on the wall, just maybe 20 feet from uh, Lafayette's grave, to Napoleon's uh, wife's first husband. Uh, and I will say this about her one son, which was one of Napoleon's stepchildren. Uh, Napoleon had a lot of nepotism going on as far as like putting family members in prominent positions, but his stepson, by and large, was probably one of the better. Uh, nepotism choices that he made. He was a pretty solid uh, commander in the field. Paperman, who printed the details for all to read. Turning Napoleon's crumbling marriage into a tabloid sensation, 
This, on top of the fact that she hadn't produced an heir, caused the emperor to divorce Josephine. Nope. Yeah, but it also was really convenient for him because his second wife then was a princess from Austria, which gave him kind of that royal tie that he needed. For nine, he lost at chess Ooh, to the Turk. Anything can happen, my friend. Proof? Check. Napoleon was an exceptional military strategist and the kind of man who had to win at everything he tried. That might be why he couldn't resist a game of chess, especially against a supposedly almost unbeatable machine. In 1809, he challenged the rarely defeated automaton chess player known as the Turk at Austria's Schönbrunn Palace. Unbeknownst to Bonaparte, the incredible gadget was actually controlled by a person hidden inside it, playing through a complex mirror system. Well, it had to be because it's 1809. There's no computer that can play chess. The fact that anybody fell for that in the first place is fascinating to me. The emperor made several illegal moves, causing the Turk to relocate his pieces back to their original spots. The Turk swept its arm across the board and knocked all the pieces off. While tickled by the machine's responses, Napoleon was unable to beat the Turk in a proper match. Number eight, he sold Louisiana to the US for dirt cheap. That he did. In his effort to take over the world, or at least as much of it as he could, Napoleon began building an empire in North America. Taking I will say this, and yes, was Napoleon really ambitious? I think we've established that he absolutely was. But uh, let's keep in mind that unlike some other future dictator that tried to take over all of Europe, uh, Napoleon didn't necessarily start all the wars that he got involved in. Remember, France was invaded first. Uh, this is even before Napoleon comes to power in France. As part of the French Revolution, uh, these nations invade France. And so uh, while he did conquer a lot of territories, uh, I would not necessarily say that he was of the mindset of world conquest like others might have been. In ownership of the Louisiana Territory in 1800. However, the economic effects of the Haitian Revolution on the French colonial enterprise caused Napoleon to relinquish all of France's territorial claims in North America to the United States. The U.S. came to the negotiation prepared to buy New Orleans and adjacent territories for $10 million. However, they were surprised when France offered all of their lands in North America for $15 million. So let's keep in mind that a lot of the Louisiana territory that was owned by the French wasn't really occupied by any French people. Uh, they had claims on that land. They had kind of nominal ownership, but it's not like it was all settled by French people. It was by and large empty or uh, occupied by uh, indigenous tribes. Uh, so what the U.S. was really buying was the rights to be able to be the ones who go in and conquer that land. Uh, and, and it makes total sense for Napoleon. He probably could have gotten more money out of it, but he just didn't want to have to deal with that stuff. This purchase gave the U.S. over 500 million acres of land at three cents an acre. Needless to say, this was a steal. Very well, that seems fair and reasonable. It's extremely fair and reasonable, considering you could just conquer it for free. What? <laughs> I mean, you know his troops are tied up in Europe. They don't know that. And you've never lost a war. They fought one war, and we helped. And we couldn't reclaim the land if you did take it, but please, I beg you, pay us something. Just pocket change. So that, that makes total sense when you see it portrayed that way, 100%. Number seven. He wrote a romance novel. I didn't novel. know that. We are different. Not surprised. I will not try to kiss you again. Napoleon's life seems. Is that the Godfather himself playing Napoleon? Marlon Brando? I didn't know he ever played him. Desiree is the name of the film. Marlon Brando as Napoleon Bonaparte. Uh, Gene Simmons as Desiree Clary. That's really fascinating. So this is before he is, is looks like it's uh, when he's a captain. Wow, that's fascinating. I had no idea. 
And it looks like it does follow through the rest of his career. And this woman ends up married to Marshall Bernadotte, which is, uh, all right, now I might have to check that one out. To have been comprised of one failed relationship after another. Though given his nature, it should be no surprise that he had a tendency to sensationalize his exploits. But each of those relationships was filled with a treasure trove of love letters from Le Petit Caporal. After a particularly tumultuous relationship with temporary fiancé Eugénie Désirée Cléry, the future queen of Sweden and Norway, Bonaparte used his writing skills to pen I the... I have no idea that he was involved romantically with Bernadotte's later wife. Wow. Romance novella Clisson et Eugénie. The novella was essentially an autobiographical account of his love affair with Cléry, although pseudonyms were given to barely conceal the identities of the lovers. Holy cow! The two most outstanding men of our time have been in love with you. And you know real beauty, but you have a way with you. Number six, he was more Italian than Didn't French. Didn't know that. I should like you to applaud, to acclaim, the victor of Toulon, this general of 26, none other than General Bonaparte. A man inextricably tied to French culture and history, Napoleon, perhaps France's most legendary leader, was actually not that French after all. The Bonaparte family was actually from the island of Corsica, which was held by Italy until it was conquered by France in 1769. Yeah, right around the time that Napoleon is born is when Corsica becomes French. Uh, and even then, and, and I had a conversation with somebody in the comments about uh, from one of the uh, Napoleon videos because I made reference to the fact that Napoleon was not ethnically French and they were saying well there is no such thing as ethnically French well there kind of is though uh, ethnicity the definition of ethnicity is really just any group of people or subgroup of people who have a shared culture shared heritage shared ancestry uh, so yes you can be ethnically French you can be ethnically Corsican uh, Napoleon's really kind of ethnic, ethnically Corsican or really ethnically Italian. It's just like here in America, if you have a family who says, well, you know, our, Itali our family's Italian. You know, I've got a, a neighbor across the street who flies an American flag and an Italian flag because their family is ethnically Italian. Most Americans are ethnically kind of a little bit of everything. But um, so, yeah, his, his family's French. He, he would have spoken French with an accent that wouldn't ha that means he wouldn't have sounded like a native French speaker because um, he would have had that unique accent even though he would have spoken French all his life most of his life I don't think he knew French as a small child though um, but he he comes to France he goes to military school his father's very connected in terms of politics and like works as an ambassador or something and um, so yeah hundred percent the year of Napoleon's birth. We must acquire Corsica, but it has been considered for some time. Well then, I should not like it to be delayed any longer. And before that, the Bonapartes were part of the Tuscan nobility. In fact, Napoleon's birth name was actually Napoleone di Bonaparte, while family yep. and friends affectionately called him Nebulio. The eventual emperor of the French only seriously began to learn fluent French when he was sent to school in France at the age of nine. But he never did learn to spell properly. Quel dommage. But must one say Bonaparte or Bonaparte? Bonaparte. Times change and names with them. Number five, he didn't exactly get along with the Catholic Church. No surprise there. Pope will think we've run into him totally by chance. I cannot let him imagine that I would make an effort to meet him. I owe him no more respect than I do to any petty little king. You cannot discuss the rise and fall of Napoleon without mentioning the Catholic Church. On the outside, he seemed to champion the church. In 1801, after the revolution and basic dismantling of the church, he signed a concordance. Wait, was that, was that who I think it is? After the revolution and... No, oh, maybe not. ...basic dismantling of the church, he signed a concordat to restore the Roman Catholic Church as the majority church in France and reinstate its power. My idea is to transform... And he had to restore it because during the French Revolution, they made a big turn toward the secular uh, and tried to separate the government. They, you know, a real attempt at separate, a major separation of church and state. Notre Dame into a Greco-Roman temple. That is to say pagan. That is to say spectacular. However, behind closed doors, he was not devout and was actually more curious about Muhammad than Jesus. His relationship with the office of the Pope may have deteriorated further if the legends are true. 
Apparently, he was to be crowned by Pope Pius VII, but at the last second, snatched the crown and anointed himself so he wouldn't have to answer to the Pope. Makes total sense. And I, I, I've seen it, but it's been a long time. That Napoleon series from 2002, I think, is one I'm going to have to dive into and watch again. Number four, he introduced canned food to the military. During the Napoleonic Wars, the French military was concerned with food preservation and worried they would not be adequately able to feed their soldiers, especially when the army was unable to obtain food in a hostile region. The military offered 12,000 francs for a suitable invention, and in 1810, Nicolas Appert won that prize by presenting glass jars that were airtight, becoming the father of the modern canning process. Napoleon must have been extremely tech-savvy for his time and jumped at this technological advantage for his militaristic pursuits. So an army that can pull off that kind of an innovation, and I don't know how successful it was because it's obviously not something that was used for most of the 19th century, um, but we've talked many times about how logistics and being able to feed and supply your army is absolutely vital to the success of an army. It's at least as important, if not more important, than actual tactics on the field. Uh, so being able to feed a huge force that's moving rapidly far from your base of supply is a game changer. Number three, he always had poison on hand for a rainy day. Those stories vary as to whether it was a pill, a vial of poison, or a packet of toxic powder. Many sources say that Napoleon carried poison with him at all times. Why? Maybe he was afraid of the potential humiliation of being captured. Or maybe he was terrified by the thought of the torture that could ensue if he did get caught. I don't know that there was any serious concern he was going to be tortured. Uh, or Because uh, look what happened both times he actually got captured. Yes, he was not treated great. But the first time he was captured, he was actually allowed to retain his title and just exiled to a small island that he would get to have control of. Uh, and then they only sent him to a much more remote location because he came back from the first one. I, I can't imagine a scenario where any of the... Um, the coalition powers would have seriously considered torturing him or anything like that. They've signed the surrender, and your majesty is honor-bound to respect it. France has given her word, sire. However, he finally chose to consume the poison on April 12, 1814, the day after he was forced to abdicate the throne. It's Only too old. it didn't work. The poison had been sitting around for at least a decade and had expired. Instead of dying, he became painfully sick and was cured by a cup of tea and a good night's sleep. Judging from what I've seen, ruling over France brings very little happiness. Ruling over this island brings even less. Number two, hmm. his little soldier lives in New Jersey. While he was alive, there was this obsession with his sex life and his personal life. He was a, he was a celebrity in the same way that we were a celebrity. This. Napoleon was certainly a man of the I world. I didn't know it was in New Jersey. But did you know that Napoleon has roots in the United States? Well, at least part of him does. After Napoleon's autopsy, his physical examiner, Dr. François Carlo Antamarchi, who was left out of Bonaparte's will, and you'll see why that's important in a minute, decided to take a memento for himself from the infamous emperor's body. What did he take, you ask? Well, he snipped off his penis. Napoleon's little soldier has changed hands and traveled the world, and eventually was bought by an American urologist in 1977, whose daughter now owns it and houses it in her basement, in New Jersey. And in case you were wondering, he was not that well endowed. This is definitely a little smaller than I thought, maybe an inch and a half was, uh, maybe two inches, inch and a half, you think? And I guess that's what happens to... to All right. Without getting into too much graphic detail, what it looks like when it's sitting in a little case in a basement in New Jersey doesn't necessarily mean how big it was other times, but that's all I'll say about that. I will say this about Napoleon's ties to America. Uh, there's a whole line of Napoleon's family who ended up Americans, which is one of the very fascinating things to me about a lot of leaders throughout world history. Uh, you've got descendants of the Romanovs who live in America. Uh, I actually got to meet Sergei Khrushchev's uh, 
or Nikita Khrushchev's son, Sergei Khrushchev, when he spoke at a local high school here, and he became an American. Stalin's got descendants who live in the United States. Hitler's closest living relatives live in the United States. It's kind of fascinating. But uh, let me show you the one line in particular. So this here is Jerome Napoleon Bonaparte. Uh, who was the son of Napoleon's brother, Jerome. So he was Napoleon's nephew. Uh, he was actually born in England in 1805, which has always been fascinating to me. Died in Baltimore, Maryland in 1870. Uh, so why does that matter? Let's take a look at his son, Charles. So this is the grand nephew of Napoleon, who was Attorney General of the United States and Secretary of the Navy under Theodore Roosevelt. And it was during his uh, tenure as Attorney General that the organization that has come to be known as the FBI was first set up. So you could argue that Napoleon Bonaparte's grandnephew is the father of the FBI. Well, I guess none of us are gonna look too good after 195 years. <laughs> <laughs> Before we get to our number one shocking Napoleon fact, let's review some honorable mentions. It's what's behind the throne that counts. My brains, my ambitions. I didn't think anybody but... ever was under the impression he was democratically elected. I mean, he was a he was a general. I think everybody just kind of always assumed that he was brought to power in a coup. Desires, my hope, my imagination, and above all, my will. Everybody was arrested for treason during the French Revolution. Number one, he wasn't as short as you no, think. No, he wasn't. Desperate act of a little man with a big Napoleon complex. Many of you may have heard of the Napoleonic complex when a short person acts overtly dominant to compensate for their size. Since that condition is named for Bonaparte, the idea that he was diminutive has persisted for centuries. British propaganda often depicted Bonaparte as little and aggressive, and the rumors spread. You all stand before me waving a piece of paper, crying abdicate, abdicate. I will not! I will not! 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 However, Napoleon was the average height for his time. At his death, he measured 5 feet 2 inches in French units, or 5 feet 6 inches in the modern English system. Uh, it's that whole 5'2 in French units that throws everybody off. People think that 5'2 means 5'2 now. And you also can't compare then to now because everybody is a couple of inches taller on average now than they were 200 years ago. So uh, honestly, to put it in perspective, to take his 5'6 or 5'7, some sources have said, uh, from back then, he'd probably be about 5'9", five, 5'10", five, today to, to keep him in line with the average for the time. Uh, so, and that, I'm 5'9 and a half, so I mean, I never felt particularly tall, but I've never really felt short either. You have depicted me as smaller than Monsieur Talleyrand. Well, sire, I was merely respecting nature's proportions. A man's scale is determined by his destiny, not by nature, monsieur. Of course, sire. Napoleon himself is partly to blame for the myth, as he preferred his elite guard to be comprised entirely of tall soldiers, which made him appear comparatively short. No wonder they called him Le Petit Caporal. Thank you for that. Do you agree with our list? Yeah, so, all right, so that was a pretty good list. Uh, there, there's a shot of Napoleon from Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, one of my favorite movies growing up. So uh, let me know your thoughts. Add to the list. Uh, is there anything that we missed that should be talked about? Use the comment section below. Let's learn together. We'll see you again soon with another video. Thanks for watching.